Quartz is the most common mineral on Earth, but it's also the most interesting. From beautiful gems to rich gold quartz ores, from high-tech essentials to low-tech glass making, you'll want to discover everything about this amazing mineral quartz. I'm Chris Ralph, the professional prospector, and today we're going to be talking about everything about the world of quartz. Quartz is amazing stuff and we use it in so many ways. It's a hard material that can withstand pressure, heat, and chemicals and retains a lot of those qualities even when it's melted into glass, which is why we use glass for cups, cooking, containers, and food bowls. Quartz is Earth's most common mineral being made of the two most common elements in the Earth's crust, silicon and oxygen. Rocks like sandstone and quartzite are nearly all quartz. But quartz is also an important part of many igneous rocks like granite or rhyolite, as well as many metamorphic rocks. Besides being an important part of many rocks, quartz is found in veins and replacements, sometimes constituting great massive deposits. In these deposits, quartz is often closely related with gold or silver. And as prospectors, we are interested in those precious metals. Let's take a look at some amazing gold and quartz ore samples. This is a piece of quartz with loads of gold in it. You can see the pieces of gold are thin and uh, among mineral collectors this thin sheets of gold are called leaf gold. It is crystalline and the gold is, is in the form of crystals. It's just very thin and that's why they call it leaf gold. Gold can be found in quartz cobbles. This piece was found at a placer mine where the miners handled you know, literally millions of quartz cobbles and going over the cobbles with a metal detector revealed hey one of them had lots of gold in it this is actually a pretty big cobble with a lot of gold in it there were several ounces of gold in this piece and of course gold can be found in quartz at hard rock mines as well this uh, little set of specimens was picked up at a small hard rock prospect that really wasn't very large but when it was gone over with a metal detector, there were just a number of pieces in the dump pile that screamed. And of course, it doesn't have to be that the quartz is in the dump pile. It can just be shed on down the hill. This piece uh, just eroded out of a quartz vein and was shed down the hill, working its way down to the creek below and never made it down into the creek. The thickness of this little vein is really only about what you see. It's maybe three quarters of an inch thick. But a vein doesn't have to be very thick to hold an awful lot of gold. And here's some gold that's right in the wall of the mine. It's still in the gold vein in place. And you can see it in among the quartz mixed in there. And that's just how it occurs in the mine. It's yet to erode out or go on the dump or go into a mill. Now, people might ask, why is gold so closely related with quartz? And there really is no fancy answer. It's quite simple. Quartz is the most common mineral on the surface of the earth and the same hot fluids that dissolve gold and make gold deposits also very commonly dissolve quartz and the same processes of cooling or relief of pressure or other things like that chemistry that cause the gold to shake out also can cause the quartz to shake out and so therefore the solutions carry them and then the solutions drop them often more or less about the same time. The contrast of yellow metallic gold and white quartz is actually so attractive that they make jewelry out of it. This kind of gold and quartz jewelry was actually very popular in the 1890s and early 1900s. It hasn't been as popular since but then there still is a market for it and there still is a desire for jewelry of this type. A question very commonly asked by prospectors is why did we see so much quartz in placer deposits and in hard rock mining areas? The answer is that most other minerals are subject to alteration by weathering. Felspar and mica minerals, as well as many others when exposed to rain and air over long periods of time, will be altered and broken down to some form of clay. On the other hand, quartz simply does not weather away like that. A chunk of quartz can sit for millions of years as nothing but a chunk of quartz. And like gold, quartz is left behind when the other minerals weather away. That is why we see so much quartz in our mining areas. The quartz that was there to begin with, it's still there. While other minerals are washed away as clay. This means that quartz can be an important indicator for gold mineralization. It's not a perfect indicator because it's so common. 
But when you see chunks of vein quartz scattered around, there is at least a possibility that there may be gold as well. Areas with no visible quartz are less likely to produce. There are plenty of quartz veins with little or no gold, but as a quick and dirty indicator that you can see at a glance, abundant quartz on the ground can sometimes be a valuable indicator that there may be gold nearby. Let's take a look at some pictures. This is from my prospecting trip to Western Australia, and you can see a handful of white rocks scattered here and there in the photograph on the ground, and those of course are quartz, and, but there's a lot more darker colored rocks, and those are ironstone. In this place, ironstone was much more abundant than the quartz, but the quartz was a good indicator in this location, and indeed I found nuggets here with my metal detector. This picture is from a gold bearing area in the Southern California deserts and you can see in the foreground a big quartz outcropping. Uh, sometimes uh, prospectors will call this a blow of quartz because it's coming up out of the ground like it's boiling up. But you can see even in the background there's bits of scattered quartz and indeed this is a gold bearing area and the quartz is a good indicator. This is from my home state of Nevada, and the amount of quartz exposed here is really not very big. A comparatively narrow vein is cropping out here on the surface, and it's shedding a little bit of quartz, and it's not causing a huge area of quartz surrounding it because it's small. But even areas like this can be a good indicator that you might be finding gold very near here. One of the important things for prospectors to know is that quartz is not necessary for gold to deposit. It just comes along for the ride. It's only a coincidence that the two are so commonly found together. So we've covered quartz and gold, but most people know quartz better as a gemstone. Quartz is extensively used in different kinds of gems depending on the color of the stone. It's fairly hard, it comes in many colors, and has good durability. So it does make a good gem for jewelry. It can also be used in decorative objects like countertops and even works of art. There are both single crystal and micro crystalline, or crypto crystalline, varieties of quartz gems. The single crystal types include rock crystal, the colorless transparent variety of quartz, like Herkimer diamonds or the crystals in a geode, but it also includes things like amethyst. And amethyst is probably the best known gem variety of quartz. Amethyst is the same as the transparent clear rock crystal, just a little bit of iron and other minerals are added to give it that unique purple color. Citrine is a gem that comes in yellow to orange to even kind of orange red colors and is less known but still very popular. Ametrine is a unique form of both amethyst and citrine in the same crystal and they're often cut so that you see a stone that's half purple and half yellow orange. It makes for something really unique. There is also rose quartz, which is a pink colored quartz that can be transparent to translucent kind of color and is used both in gems and as a decorative material. There's also smoky quartz, which is a kind of a brown colored variety of crystal quartz that's colored by traces of aluminum replacing some of the silicon. And finally, there's rutilated quartz, which is usually clear to smoky in color, but has needles of rutile, which is a mineral of itself, titanium dioxide, it, it grow, that grew within the quartz crystal. Let's take a look at some of the single crystal varieties of quartz. And probably the best known variety of quartz crystal is the amethyst, the beautiful purple gemstone. It comes in beautiful geodes, and I've seen ones that range from pretty small up to more than 10 feet long. It's just amazing the size these can come in. And they can be cut into some amazing gemstones like this one, which is a, it has a carved back instead of just a simple faceted back. And they come in colors from lighter purple like this, through more medium purple tones like this beautiful gem, through to deeper purple tones like uh, the ones in this large oval gemstone. Next we can talk about citrine. Now citrine is actually made from amethyst. This is basically the part of an amethyst geode that you see here, but it's been heated. And you, if you heat the purple of amethyst up hot enough, it will turn to this orange color. 
It does also come in large sizes and not all citrine is produced by heating amethyst. This is a natural crystal. It's more than a foot tall and probably weighs on the order of 20 pounds. And yet it has a natural color. This is how it came out of the ground. Now like amethyst, citrine comes in a range of colors that range from a lighter tone, like as in this gem. The colors then range through more medium tones, such as you would see in this beautiful orange gem. And the colors range all the way to this very deep toned orange gem that you would see here in this picture. There is a deposit in Bolivia where both citrine and amethyst occur naturally in the same stone as you can see displayed here. This is not two different stones glued together. This is just one crystal with two colors. The mixture of the color in these unusual stones isn't always a simple one half purple one half orange. It can be very complex as shown in this stone. And when these unusual stones are cut depending on how the cutter works it you can either get a bicolor stone like this where the cutter has purposefully separated the two tones or if the cutter purposefully mixes the two colors you can get an unusual gem like this which depending on the angle you're looking at it flashes both purple and orange next we'll take a look at smoky quartz which is the brown to slightly brownish gray colored quartz that we see so often Smoky quartz also comes in some very large sizes. Now one of the things about smoky quartz is that most quartz crystals, even the clear colorless ones, if they're irradiated, if, in other words if they're hit with radiation, they turn this smoky brown color. And it's been done many times that you can take clear quartz and turn it smoky brown like this with radiation. And in fact the ones that we see that are naturally brown like this are thought to be naturally irradiated by traces of radioactive stuff in rocks. Most rocks carry tiny traces of radioactive material and if exposed for super long lengths of time the quartz that's been there is exposed to that radiation and will turn this smoky brown by natural processes. And smoky quartz is widely used for a variety of decorative purposes. These are quartz crystals, smoky quartz crystals, that the faces of the crystal have been polished to make them clearer and to enhance their beauty. Smoky quartz can also be cut into beautiful gemstones, just like this example shown here. If one takes the irradiated quartz crystal that's turned smoky and then carefully and lightly heats it, you can get this yellow yellow green kind of color as shown here and it can produce an interesting colored gem and the color unless you're heating it to temperatures much higher than what any human will withstand uh, the color is stable and will remain this way and of course we have the colorless rock crystal version which can make some really beautiful decorative items and is mined all over the world and for decorative purposes, the rock quartz crystal comes in humongous sizes. This specimen here on display is over 10 foot tall. And finally, let's talk about rose quartz. Now this is a very unusual specimen of rose quartz in that it shows individual single pink crystals. Usually the rose quartz that we see on the market is much more massive and looks more like this where you really can't identify any individual crystals it's just big chunks of pink quartz some of the better quality rose quartz is like this you can see it's highly translucent but it's still not really transparent enough to cut good faceted gems usually when you cut faceted gems out of rose quartz they end up being hazy or sleepy Still, rose quartz is perfectly good for making decorative objects like this bowl here. Little towers and knickknacks of various types and even bookends are also popular items made out of rose quartz. They also make decorative spheres. And this sphere displays a unique property of quart rose quartz in that it shows a six-ray star. And the star on this sphere will move around just like a star sapphire or some other similar gem. 
The microcrystalline group also includes many varieties of chalcedony, agate, and jasper. These are all very finely fibrous, transparent to translucent, often waxy looking forms of quartz that are very commonly found in irregular masses. They don't have an obvious crystal shape because the crystals in them are microscopically tiny and bound together. The extremely tiny quartz crystals in them are so intergrown that they appear smoothly mixed and do not give any external evidence of their crystal nature. There are many, many names for these stones depending on their color patterns. Carnelian is a name given to an orange-red to brown colored chalcedony. Chrysoprase is an apple green colored form of chalcedony. Bloodstone is a green form that's dotted with red spots. Agate is another form of chalcedony with variegated different color patterns. The most common agates have colors arranged in bands, but there are some others like the fortification agates which have various colors in an irregular pattern of banding. There are also others in which the variation pattern is due to the branching inclusions that are within the, the rock like moss agates. My favorite agate is the fire agate. It's kind of the king of all the agates. It's a really beautiful stone, which is colored by iridescent layers to give a kind of an iridescent mix of blues and greens and reds and yellows and oranges. All the colors of the rainbow. Jasper is another variety of very fine grained cryptocrystalline quartz that's usually found in shades of yellow, red, or orange, or even brown or green. The common colors are due to iron mineral inclusions. Less common colors include gray or black or blue. Let's take a look at some samples of agate, jasper, and chalcedony. We'll start out by taking a look at some jasper. Now jasper is a mixture of quartz and iron oxides and some other things, but it's very popular. It comes in a lot of colors. This is mostly a reddish kind of color, but it comes in many patterns. This is a more colorful version. And Jasper is often made into various decorative objects, like this is a pair of bookends. It can also be cut into cabochons that are quite attractive, but Jasper is in general something with big, big, bold color patterns. Next, we'll take a look at the agates and chalcedonies, and they'll start off here with carnelian, which is a beautiful form of agate that's some sort of shade of orange. These gems really can be quite beautiful, and the orangey color is due to tiny traces of iron in the agate. Next we have bloodstone, a form of agate that's green with red spots. And believe it or not, it's still iron minerals that are coloring both the green and the red spots in this version of agate. Next we have chrysoprase, a green to mint green version of agate that is colored by nickel, not iron minerals. This stone can be cut into beautiful and attractive cabochons, like this one shown here, but it is also cut into decorative objects, like this sphere. Many agates show beautiful banding patterns, like this specimen. These lines are basically like the growth rings of a tree. As the agate grows and conditions change, you get these lines that grow inside it. Sometimes the banding patterns show beautiful different contrasting colors, as in this piece. Some of these types of agates are basically fillings for geodes. And you can see that the different stages uh, as they grow and fill in, some eventually grow a, a quartz crystal growth on the interior and the interior opening, but some just fill up solid with agate. Another interesting and popular type is petrified wood. You can see almost the rings of growth as you look, the circular patterns in this cut across the log. Whole forests of wood can become buried underneath mud and other materials during uh, catastrophic events of uh, lava flows or other mud flows and sorts of things like that. And then eventually over time the wood gets replaced with quartz. These types of petrified wood deposits occur in many places. These pink limb casts are actually from northeastern Nevada. Yet another well-known type is the moss agate, where dendritic growths offset or contrast with the body color of the agate. This beautiful specimen is from northern Nevada. 
Moss agate actually comes in many colors and both the dendrites and the background body color of the stone can vary quite a bit. But as I mentioned, out of all the agates and chalcedony and jasper, my very favorite is the fire agate. This stone is just amazing. In my opinion, the fire agate really is the king of all the agates and jaspers and chalcedonies. This iridescent color is really beautiful. It's considered an excellent gemstone for men's jewelry, and I've always thought I wanted to have a ring made of this. I really look forward to that. Someday maybe I will. It's probably the rarest of all the agates, being found only in a few places in southeastern California, Arizona, and into northern Mexico. I've hunted it in a few locations and found some really nice fire agate stones when I was out in the field. Quartz has an unusual property known as piezoelectricity, which when a force is applied to the crystal, the stress of the deformation generates a small electrical charge. This property works just as well in reverse so that when electricity is applied, it generates a small deformation. This property is used in hundreds of different types of devices, including computers, cell phones, televisions, radios, and others. We make hundreds of tons of synthetic quartz every year for our technology needs. In addition, all the silicon used in our electronics comes from quartz as well. Let's take a look at a picture. These are the kind of quartz crystals that we make industrially. And although these are huge, they're cut up into very, very, very tiny slices and bits and pieces that are used in all of our electronics, like I say, like cell phones and computers and the like. We grow hundreds of tons of the silicon rods as shown in the back here of this photo and then we take them and slice them up into little discs like you see in the foreground and on those discs are made all of our transistors and integrated circuit chips, diodes and lots of electronics that are essential to our modern lifestyle. As far as low tech uses we use quartz as an abrasive including for things like sandblasting, scouring cleansers, grinding media, and grit for sanding and sawing. Huge amounts of quartz are melted down to make glass for windows and bottles and the like. A very special type of sized quartz sand is used in oil well fracking to recover oil from difficult wells. Quartz sand is used in the production of refractory bricks because of its sheer strength and resistance to heat. Quartz sand is often blended in with cohesive agents such as clay, resin, sodium silicate, oil, and the like, and used for the purpose of molding for metal casting. Engineered quartz is processed industrially to be used as countertops and slabs in residential and commercial buildings. So you can see why quartz really is the mineral of a thousand uses. Now we talked about gold quartz and prospecting, and most of my videos are about gold prospecting and related topics. And if you want to become a better prospector and learn more about prospecting for gold and how to find it for yourself, well, I wrote a book about that. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my book right now. So let me tell you a little bit more about my book. Um, it's called Fistful of Gold, and I wrote it because I want you to be able to go out and find for yourself Fistful of Gold. And uh, you can see that it's a, an encyclopedia with all kinds of information, pictures, and that sort of thing. It's not in color, but uh, uh, color would have cost me a lot more to have printed, and so the book would have cost a lot more. It's for sale on Amazon, and you can pick it up. I'll put a link in the description below. I also serve as the editor for a, a prospecting magazine. It's ICMJ's Prospecting and Mining Journal. And honestly, you should check that out. We've got stories uh, and information, legal stuff, everything you know to increase your skills as a prospector. I write articles in this every month, and a lot of other very experienced prospectors contribute to the magazine as well. So check the magazine out. Also, I have a website, and the website is... Uh, at nevadaoutbackgems.com. I'll put a link for it in the description below. But there's gobs of information there that you will find useful in your prospecting efforts. Finally, I want to say that I really appreciate your comments and thoughts and even a positive criticism. Don't come on there and just toss out insults because I'll just delete your comments. But if you've got uh, helpful things to say and questions to ask, do write and, and put those in the comments because I answer my comments to people. 
and uh, you'll hear from me in, in you know, in, in responding to you. Uh, so if you've enjoyed this video and you like what you see and you're interested in uh, finding out more, well then sign up, subscribe, and hit the, uh, the notification bell so they'll let you know when I post new videos. And, you know, like it and share it if, again, you, you see stuff that you really are excited about. And I'll be coming out with lots more new videos. And so we'll see you again real soon.